Hello, this is the RPG Crawler, and welcome back to my uh, RPG Storytime bookshelf tour. God damn, that escaped me. We have covered all of the Dungeons and Dragons shit, so let's look at the non-Dungeons and Dragons stuff. Now, um, interestingly enough, a lot of these things up here are from a time and place wherein my... These... these are from the same era that I was running my second edition stuff. Um, they're from like the late 90s, uh, early 2000s, a lot of them. Uh, we'll go ahead and start with the stuff down here. Now, the stuff down here is, uh, is a mix of Shadowrun and other things. A lot of these books are... Attempts to get into other games that never really panned out. A lot of dead end games, a lot of sci fi games. My my group and, and those of you who followed my channel realize that I'm not really a huge fan of sci fi RPGs. I recognize them. I've had fun with a couple of them, but I haven't really got into them the same way that others have. Um. And it did not keep me from spending money trying to find one that it would, that, that I really like, though. I never got the Cyberpunk series, which is sad because I've heard it's really good. Um, I did get Shadowrun. I got uh, Mech Warrior and Battletech. Actually, the first Battletech uh, thing I ever bought was a boxed set back in the 80s. Uh, FASA's, like, I don't know if it was the original one, but it was one of the original ones, uh, Battletech. And I played the hell out of that with just one other person, and, and we really never actually got beyond that. Um, let's, so let's go ahead and st uh, start taking a look. First of all, there's a non, a non-sci-fi thing. And this is a book that I picked up for like three bucks. Um, the place, yeah, the place was going out of, out of, no, 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 you know what happened is, well, it wasn't going out of business. Uh, I had seen it on the shelf sitting there for years and years and years and nobody ever bought it and it might be because it's in uh pounds not not um not dollars it's a uk book tunnels and trolls i believe this is fifth edition um let me take a look uh what can what edition is this? This was back before editions became a serious thing. Might be third edition. Anyway, um, what Tunnels and Trolls is? It's kind of a takeoff on D and D. It was produced shortly after D and D, and it was designed to be a streamlined um, rules light format, and one that was friendly to either one-on-one -on -one play or solo play and in fact there are a lot of adventures that are designed that you can still get to this day for solo play and it went through a series of quick revisions in, in quick in quick uh in quick succession up until the mid the late 70s yeah this one is printed in 86 so i got this a full it'd been on the shelf for a full decade before i picked it up because i picked this up in the mid 90s uh, but it was basically just a reprint of a prior edition. And what what it was, was it was sitting there, and I finally picked it up, and I actually liked, I loved this little thing, but I never got any way to play with it, play it with. And then it basically sat stagnant from, like, the late 70s, mid-80s, until, like, just just at the, the top of this decade, uh, around late 2000s, early 2010s. Um, there was a resurgence, and they printed a 7th and then like a 7.5 edition of the book. They're worth looking into if you like solo play. I, I really need to pick up the new the new versions. They, they look interesting. They're really useful for not only solo and one-on-one -on -one play, but if you want to run like just a deadly dungeon crawl and you do not want to spend like two hours making a character... And combat goes real fast in this too. Once you get used to it, oh, that's that's with everything. But it is a purely narrative. You don't need uh, anything but 
uh, dice, and I think only six-sided dice. I'm not sure about the rest. Um, you just need a handful of dice and this book, and you're good to go. You make takes like about like maybe five, six, maybe five, ten minutes to make characters. Combat is just a combination of dice rolls versus a static number, and it goes, it flows really super fast. So if you're just looking to get a group of people through a dungeon crawl with no preparation, with with nothing but their wits, it is a good system. This is a good system to use. One of the modern ones is probably going to be a better bet for you. They're very similar, same mechanics all the way through. Um, and it's humorous. It's got a lot of humor into it. It's got a lot of dark humor in some of the uh, in some of the uh, adventures. Anyway, excellent system. Excellent system. Tunnels and Trolls. Tunnels and Trolls. All right, next um, you see a bunch of tattered books that once more break my whole uh, this you know this shelf is for completed stuff only um, this is actually a system that I really enjoyed it is by West End games and it's another one where I lost the actual box it came in um, it's called Shatter Zone and I remember commenting on this when I saw somebody had uh, some company had recently put it up you can get the PDFs of this system on drive through now and I will probably put a link in the description below if I remember to. Uh, but what it is is Shatter Zone is a sci-fi system based in a far future where humanity is spread to the edge of the galaxies and you basically there there's a lot of interesting stuff and it was actually a pretty decent system before uh, Western Games went down. But the thing I like most about this it's this is what it looks like uh it's got a player's guide, it's got a universe guide, and it's got a book where I seem to have completely lost the uh, cover to it. The rule book. But there we go. Um, so you've got three books, um, just like the others. you got the, the rule book, which is the DM's guide. you got the player's guide, which tells you how to make characters, and the universe guide, which tells you like the various uh, challenges you can face. But it's also got these splat books. Arsenal, which is your equipment guide, which I loved equipment guides back in the day. Man, for these sci-fi games, I would buy equipment guides before I bought the main game. And then I would get into it. But the the, the real gem of this thing, and I don't know if they've actually re-released this. It's called Tech Book Ships. And the thing about Shatter Zone, it was an okay system... I didn't really get to play it that much because it does require some cards, and I still have the cards laying around somewhere. It does require cards to play. It was one of those hybrid systems where it was like you had cards to deal stuff, and then you had like dice. Anyway, um, but the real gem about this system was the ships. It had a ship combat system that was really neat and really enjoyable in a kind of slow-paced but deadly kind of way. It was really in-depth. I'm actually kind of looking forward to uh, how Starfinder does it, because if they... This is the... I haven't played a lot of sci-fi games, mind you, but this was the best ship-to-ship -ship combat system in a system that I'd ever seen. Um, I'm sure that I will have people disagree with me. I never played the Star Wars ones. Um, I don't know how ship-to-ship -ship combat went in those, but uh, but yeah, for a lot of the sci-fi games, this was just really neat. Uh I love spaceship to spaceship combat. It's uh, it can really f screw people over even even more than in a fantasy game. Because in a fantasy game, if your ocean going ship goes down, you can still try and swim and cling to the uh, cling to the rafts and stuff. If your spaceship blows up, you might you're just you're just shit out of luck a lot of times. Next is another system I tried to get into, uh, Warhammer. Uh, Warhammer, I got the rule book, I got the battle book, and I got the undead. And this is from... Hell, this is from... Uh, the mid-90s. So they have really, really expanded beyond these rules since then. Uh, Warhammer is still a thriving community. This is one of those ones where I started collecting the books. I even got a couple miniatures and then decided I had better things to do with my money than spend my entire income and take a second job on miniatures. Uh, so 
It's one of those failed products. I love the universe. I love the Warhammer universe. I want to get the Warhammer Fantasy book because they, for a while there, they had a, a whole role playing game based on the Warhammer universe. Uh, but yeah, it was too pricey for my taste, so I never really got into it. Next is a book that is not so much a. This is not a role playing book in and of itself. It's called the Fantasy uh, Role Playing Gamers Bible. And this was produced, I believe, in the mid to late 90s. Um, I, yeah, I'm not seeing the, the, the uh, thing. But it's basically a history and examination of, of uh, role-playing games, fantasy role-playing games, from the inception of the stuff all the way to uh, when this book was produced. And if you are a RPG historian... It's a really good source. It even touches on computer RPGs up until like the mid '90s. So I don't even think it's got. Uh, I don't even think it's got the uh, Baldur's Gate series in it because it was produced before that. But yeah, it's an interesting read, and I keep it for historical purposes. Um, this and Desktop and Dungeons. Yeah, this was produced in '96. This and Desktop and Dungeons are two books that I really high, highly recommend to any. Uh, any role-playing game historian. And I don't know if there's a newer version of this. There's probably a newer version. I'm not sure. I'd have to take a look. <clears throat> also, why that last one was there, I have no idea. I, I don't remember putting it there. I thought I put it in my non-fiction shelf. Anyway, now back to role-playing games. In Nomine, which is a... Really nice, really class book. This was during the uh, the golden age of World of Darkness where people were trying to mimic that shit. And you can really tell in the art design and the artwork. I mean, am I looking at In Nomine or am I looking at... Or am I looking at a World of Darkness book or am I looking at something else? And um, it's a Steve Jackson Games book. And In Nomine is basically you're playing an angel. And some are fallen and some are not. And it's a role-playing game where you play an angel. Um, I never really got into it. Um, I picked it up because it was neat and it was on sale. Next up is... Oh my god, here's the map from my original Battletech box set from back in the day. Holy crap, that's old. That's older than a lot of people who watch my channel. Um, Battletech Compendium, uh, which was basically an expansion of rules. Whoops. This was basically a, a battle... You could play Battletech. It's got all the rules in it. It's got the rules for the mechs. It's got the rules for non-mech vehicles. Special case rules. Basically, you could pick this up and play Battletech with it. Um, you would need the miniatures and or tokens, and you'd still need the maps. But, uh... Those are things that you could actually come up with. But yeah, if you if you wanted to pick up Battletech and just play a quick game, you could play play this. I know it goes in way more in-depth than this. This does not include a lot of mechs. This includes just your basic mechs, I believe. I don't even know if it includes any mechs. But uh, using the rules here, you could actually uh, set up a decent game of Battletech. The reason I got this, though, was not as a standalone Battletech rule set, but as a companion to... Uh, Mech Warrior, which I wanted to get into. And Mech Warrior is set in the Battletech universe. And in this game, you play as um, a character, not necessarily a Mech Warrior, but you play as a, uh, you role play as a character in the Battletech universe. So it is a sci fi role playing game. You can play technicians, you can play spies, you can play whatever. And it gives you rules for interpersonal combat and, and basic mech rules and all that. Or you can play a mech pilot. And the problem with this game is that uh, the mechs are so focused on in the Battletech universe, and you can play like a ship pilot or whatever, that if you want to really go from planet to planet and stuff, like half of your group is going to end up spending most of their character creation points on like vehicles and shit. So keep that in mind if you want to play your own, if you're playing your own mercenary company. The better bet would be to play like as... Uh, subsets of a house or a mercenary company or whatever. Usually a house gives you better options. 
Uh, but then the DM can tell you what to do and where to go and so forth. And it helps if you're all from the same house, because otherwise you could just get fucked. Next is another attempt on my part to get into sci-fi gaming, although it's very useful for non-sci-fi gaming. Uh, first of all, it's GURPS, and I believe this is the yeah the third edition. It's the basic set. This is the game where I've spent more time creating characters and less time playing than any game. There were entire sessions where I would do nothing but sit down and create characters for GURPS, whether they be fantasy, whether they be whatever. Um, and I've only ever actually played it like like for a grand total of like five hours, but I've created characters for like 12, 14, 15 hours straight. Um, I want to get into this because again, because you know they're still going strong. I don't know what edition they're up to. I think like fourth edition, maybe fifth edition. Um, um, uh, and the thing about GURPS is that it is a generic universal role playing system, so it's got. It can be adapted to, like, any genre of role-playing. Uh, specifically, I have two books here. One is Aliens, and one is Ultratech. And that was my attempt to try to get, like, a sci-fi alien thing going with my group. Uh, because I knew that they enjoyed making characters for GURPS because of past experience. But it just didn't take off. Which is a damn shame, because I really want to play more GURPS just to find out what's it. I know that they've got some sort of dungeon crawler type uh, expansion at some point. I don't know if they still make it or whatever. But they had like several books that were nothing but fantasy dungeon crawler type uh, expansions. Next up is Heroes and Villains Unlimited. Now these are, um, these are Palladium games. And Palladium rule system actually had like a generic rule system. In fact, I I don't remember what it's called. I think it might just be Palladium role playing system. These are based on that same system. Um, there was a short stint where some of my group was very interested in trying to find a, like a superhero game, and this is like the only one that I actually kind of enjoyed. We tried out like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles at the time and a couple of other uh, superhero games. I don't I don't enjoy superhero games. No, I'll, I'll say flat out I don't enjoy them. But if I had to play one, I would probably go with this one. Um, it's got a very open system. You can make all kinds of shit. It's almost as open at GURPS as GURPS, if not more so. Um, the reason I've got these is because somebody... Uh, yeah, they're, they're marked up too. Uh... A friend of a friend had brought them over to their house to play the game and then forgot them and didn't want to come pick them up. And then they brought them over to my place to play the game and they forgot them and they were saying, well, they're not mine and I can't get a hold of the person who originally had them. So they kind of ended up here. Um, but I'm not complaining. I'm not complaining. They got a spot on my shelf. Not a big spot, but they got a spot on my shelf. Um, this reminds me, the, the one time I actually, we played this a couple times actually. We never played more than one session with the same characters. And one session, uh, uh, they were they were like, let's go ahead and just take off the caps of points. And you can take as many advantages and just, I don't know if that's the same system though. Is that same system? I remember one of them. I can't remember whether it was this or GURPS. But at one point they said, here, uh, there's usually a cap on it, what disadvantages you can take to balance out your advantages. We're going to take the cap off. So I made like this paranoid I can't remember if it's this or GURPS though. God damn. Anyway, one of these one of these times I made this like this paranoid pyromaniac sadist uh amnesiac and, and so on and so forth all the way down the line who could fly and throw fireballs at will. <laughs> so basically all they did was fly around and randomly set shit on fire. <laughs> and the only way to really get them to go with uh, with a story... It was a, a really easy way to get them involved with the group is to say, hey, we're going to go set this place on fire. Whether or not they actually intended to set it on fire, and boom, I was right there. Uh, my character was right there. Uh, that's why they have caps on these things. Huh. 
Next up is a game that I never played, and I only picked it up because it was on an extreme sale. And now I've read it, I kind of realize why it was on extreme sale. It's called uh, Underground, and it is a very punk-style book. It's kind of a punk comic book look at the far distant future of like the mid-20th, 21st century, which we're almost there, wow. And some of them they got right, but some of them they really, really... It's always interesting to play a near-future game because, like, now that it's like 20 years down the line, you see the kinds of shit that they came up with. Uh, yeah, Underground has neat art. It's got high-gloss, full-color pages. It is an awkward-as-hell system. And they went really wrong really quick in a number of places. Uh, it's campy. It's kind of punk. And it's goofy as hell. And they've got like a fast food joint in the lore that, se that serves like people. So uh, not a big fan of some of the political commentary in it. But it's out there and it's strange. Next up, in my continuing search for a sci-fi uh, role-playing game that would be awesome, is one that I got from um, this Alternity. And this is basically... Uh, I picked it up because I thought it was going to be like D&D 3.5 in space or whatever. No, it was still TSR at the time. It was going to be like Dungeons & Dragons in space. And it kind of splits the difference between 2nd and 3rd edition, but in like the most asinine way possible. And the races are indeed... D and D races in space. Uh, it's by Richard Baker and Bill Sl uh, Slavishek, so it's got cred on it. Um, uh, the uh, players, players' handbook and the game master guide. There was a uh, there was a campaign for this that's still in in production, I believe, to this day. I, I think, or until very recently. There's still people that play this game. I never played it. I looked through this stuff. I could not get my group to play it for the life of them. They said, oh, we'd rather play something completely different if we're going to go sci-fi. They hated this game. And I don't know why. They like took one look at it and they were like, nah, we're not going to do that. Um, and then when I finally did, you know, and when I've, and I've read these rules in and out, in and out, and out. But it's been years and years since I've done it. The tech in this book uh, as sci-fi... Some of it, especially in terms of computer terms, was, like, obsolete when they came out. They were talking about, oh, in the far future of... this was These were produced in the late 90s. In the far future of the 20... The end of the 21st, late... Or early 22nd century, you can have computers that you can hold in your hand that will be the, the as powerful as desktops. And I was like... I read that and I was like, dude... I can literally, and, th and this was not long after the game came out. In fact, it was like a year after it came out. And I was like, dude, I can walk to my Best Buy and pick up this far-flung future technology that you're talking about right now. Not entirely sure that some of, the, some of this tech it was obviously written by somebody that had uh, very little clue about, about, <laughs> about tech, basically. But... Interesting game system. There are a lot of... Exp not a lot, but there's uh, several splat books for it. Um, if you ever want to play it. Uh, I have no intention of ever playing it again, but I'm going to leave it on my shelf. Alright, next is another section. This is Shadowrun 2nd Edition. Now, I believe they're up to like 4th Edition now. Oh, Shadowrun... <sighs> How I love thee and how I hate thee. Um, yeah, Shadowrun. What can I say about Shadowrun? I can say that I managed to scrape to get... I invested a lot in it. I've got a several splat books for it. i got splat books that people probably wish they had. Um, and I p played it once. We made characters three times, but in two of those sessions... Uh, people had to go before we finished because, you know, when you make a new character for a complex system, 
that you're not used to. It takes quite a while. So in two of those sessions, we made characters. Uh, then people had to go before we could actually play, and we like lost them because there was like months and months between sessions. And then one time we actually did get to play, and um, it didn't go too well. Which is a damn shame, because I think it was more a lack of experience with the setting itself. Anyway, Shadowrun, for those who don't know, is a cyberpunk-style near-future world where magic has returned. So you've got orcs and elves and shit with, uh, with guns and hacking. And I've heard that the newer versions are really playable and really well done, and I really want to try and get into them. Although I have no reason to, because nobody, nobody in my uh, groups that I play with plays Shadowrun. But uh, you heard me mention before that I would pick up, uh, I loved equipment books and such. Man, Shadowrun has so many equipment books. I got the Grimoire, which is like magic shit. So you can see they're like summoning a demon in a, in a room full of like uh, computers and shit. Uh, they got Shadow Tech, which was uh, basically cutting edge technology. And some of this was like biotechnology. So you could have like... Uh, like cybernetic enhancements, like replacement arms, but then you could also have bion uh, biological augmentations. Uh, Rigor 2, which I believe is like a, a redo of a prior book, and Riggers are basically... Uh, their focus was vehicles, so you could get like vehicles and shit, but they also dealt with things like drones. And uh, I believe some people have mentioned that they don't like Riggers in their games because then it just turns into, oh, we're going to send the drones on in. Uh, but they're a viable class in some instances. instances. Virtual Realities 2.0, which is the Decker's Handbook, which uh, Decker's are basically hackers in Shadowrun. Uh, and the thing about Shadowrun is that as the game grew up, the internet grew up with it. So every time that they turn around and say something was put into the far, far, far future, I mean, except for the virtual, virtual reality representation and actual neural implants, uh for like the actual functioning of the network a lot of times they would say oh you can do this this and this in the far flung future and again uh future caught up with them uh in terms of actual uh you know everything's going to be run by computers in in several decades oh well everything's run by computers now that, that kind of thing um let's see then you got the street samurai catalog which is one of the first ones, it's uh, basically gear that you would use as an adventurer on the street. You got, like, uh, a bunch of neat different guns and shit. You got uh, different t kinds of armor, different kinds of uh, vehicles, all that stuff. This is one of those equipment guides that I like. And then my last Shadowrun 2nd Edition book that I've got. There's another equipment guide. It's called Fields of Fire. And Fields of Fire is basically your heavy military equipment. And it's got some really nice stuff in there as well. Um, holy crap, the pages are all fucked up. It's like, a, it's like I shat on this. Hold on. I think what happens, I dropped a soda on this. And I got a, I got a funny story about a dropped soda. I might tell it sometime. Um, oh, fuck it. I'll tell it now. This is RPG. Oh, no. I've still got an entire bookshelf worth of shit to go through. Ah, well, I'll tell it at some later date. Oh, no. Never mind. I'll, I'll, I'll tell it now. So, um, Drop Soda. I used to play in a lot of gaming stores. I used to play in a lot of people's houses. I was the DM, and I, a lot of times I would bring in my own books and uh, supplements, and I would put them on the table and stuff. So one time, during a D&D &D game, I had my books on the table. We had just completed a scene, right? So we had just completed a scene. And um, you know, I go over, uh, I go over to take a break because we've been role playing for like several hours. So I walk over, walk away from the table, you know, do my business, go ahead and, and hit the bathroom, grab a grab a drink, whatever. I uh, not grab a drink, grab some uh, grab some pizza or whatever. And so I come back, right? And um, somebody's dropped a two liter on the table while I was out. You know, two liter of uh, Pepsi, I think. And uh, nobody picked it up because it fell on my books. And nobody picked my books up because I assumed they assumed that, like, I would, like, blow a gasket, right? So I come back and I see my books sitting there just soaking in this soda. And everybody's sitting around. It's not like they didn't see it, right? So I pick up the Pepsi. I go ahead and start mopping it up, get my books all dried out. I'm not saying a word. They're just watching me do this. 
I look around and say, you know, none of who who dropped this? Who dropped this? And they're like, nobody came forth. I'm like somebody dropped it because it wasn't like that when I left. And still no answer. And I say, like, oh come on, man. I ain't gonna make you pay for them. I just want to know so you can be more careful next time. Still no response. And they're just kind of kind of be like the eerie silence. I say, well, um, why didn't anybody pick it up? Uh, well, we were busy. We didn't notice. I was like, bullshit. You didn't notice. It's all over the place. I see you moved your shit. Yeah. Well, well, you know, and and I said, so my my books have been soaking in this soda for like who knows how long, like about five six minutes, right? They are, they're not ruined, but they're, they're pretty close to it. So I set my books aside to dry out, you know, slap some paper towels in between the pages, try and soak up that soda before it stains all of them. Um, I sit back down, and we had just completed a big arc, right? You know, they had rescued this uh, noble woman, and they brought her back. So somebody chimes, oh, do you have your, the experience for this session? You know, because they, they had rescued the noble woman. And I'm sitting there like this. You're asking me for experience, and I've just spent like the last five minutes cleaning up soda that you guys, you know, basically left sitting on my books. And he got real quiet. So now I haven't had a chance to rest. I haven't had a chance to figure out your experience. But it doesn't matter because we're not done. And they're like, well, we rescued, uh, we rescued the noble woman and we brought her back. I said, yeah, yeah, but we're not done with the session. So you bring the noble woman back to her, uh, back to her father. Right? You're in, you're in a quiet hall. There's not, a, not as much celebration as you thought there'd be, right? Everybody starts getting real quiet and reaching for their character sheets again. I'm like, so, you know, you uh, present her to her father. Her father goes, oh, thank you, heroes. You have brought her back. And her father is a major noble. And then he walks over and embraces her. And, I'm so glad to see you, Father. And everybody's like, yay, but why haven't we got our experience yet? I'm sitting there going, well, it's, we're not done with the session. Just give me a minute. Give me a minute. And as you bring her to her father, all of a sudden it grows real dark outside. And everybody gets real quiet. I'm like, the windows, they're still open, but it's like night outside all of a sudden. And they start saying, whoa. Well, I go check the windows out. I'm, I'm going to go check. I'm going to go look out the door. And basically the entire group kind of spread away and started looking at the... Because they're like in the... Not in the main keep, but like in like um, the main hall of a manor house. Start looking out the windows. They're looking out the door, trying to figure out what's going on. And so it's like, you see these black clouds have spread outside, blotting out the sun. The peasants outside are looking very startled, staring up at the sky. And then you hear a gurgled cry from the... Uh, you know, from from the noblewoman and his and his daughter, sitting there, and they're saying, there, "What? What's going on?" And they turn back to him, and I'm like, "You see, uh, the this this young woman whom you've spent all your time rescuing with has grown uh, very pale, and her, you know, she's grown fangs, and she's clinging to her father, and draining the last of his blood as you see, as you uh, as you watch, and they're like." Oh shit, a vampire. And uh they run towards her. And I'm like, and at that moment the door is closed from outside. And you basically uh some of the guests that have been standing around all muted throw off their clothes. Uh not throw off their throw off their cloak, not their clothes. What the fuck? Anyway, Throw off their cloaks, and they too have grown pale and in, in, in bare fangs and come at you. It's a vampire ambush. And um, if those of you who know 2nd edition and earlier know that vampires are no joke. They drain like two levels apiece. So even though theoretically they could have taken a wall, this ambush, this first round, basically drastically reduces their, chan their chances. And, um, you know, we play the fight out, and they lose. They lose and they die, <laughs> and um, and uh, one of them, one of the players at the end was like, you know what? I thought you said we were going to end the the campaign this session. You told us last session we were going to end it. I said, yeah. Well, it's ended, right? And they were like, well, that wasn't the way we wanted to end it. And I said, yeah, but it was ended, 
you were at the end and they they were asking and, and then I asked them well why did you want experience if it was the if it was the end well we were hoping we would go ahead and continue these characters in your next campaign I was like my next campaign is going to be starting at level one first of all and number two I had a good I had a, a speech written I had a speech written the king was going to thank you. I had all the rewards written and they're like wait what and I said, yeah, yeah, I had the speech and your rewards and your characters were going to retire and glory. I had all that on notes in one of my books that got soaked through with fucking soda. I can't read them anymore. And they got real quiet again. So next time you spill soda, just think, maybe it's not just the books that that you're sitting there watching soak through. It might be the key to your character's future. I admit it was it was it was a little bit of an asshole move on my part, but Fuck them. <laughs> and it was the end of the campaign anyway. I, all I had was the happy ending that they were going to try and, and, and like ride off into the sunset and retire. But no. Those fuckers will watch one of my books get ruined. They get to watch their character. <laughs> they get to watch their characters get a bad end. Uh, anyway. not Maybe not the wisest way to do it, but holy shit, I was pissed. Um, oh, fuck. One more shelf to do. Yeah, this is what I didn't want to get distracted from. White Wolf. Um, I've got two more things on this shelf, actually. Even this stuff is all White Wolf. All White Wolf all the way. I've got uh, these books, which were like uh, splat books for the various systems. Um, these were like for Mind's Eye Theater, which I think was like the live action stuff. Um, and then all of this is uh, the old White Wolf stuff from the 90s. And from for those who don't know, and I'm not going to pull them all out because some of them are pretty piss poor condition, but you had uh, Vampire the Masquerade and uh, Werewolf... Werewolf the Apocalypse, which which I don't... I have. I've got Werewolf. It's just not up here. Um, it's probably in a cabinet over there. Uh, but there was also the lesser known uh, Changeling, uh, the Dreaming, which was like fairies and shit. Um, Mage, the Ascension, which was magic-sensitive mortals. Um, Wraith Oblivion, which was my personal favorite, which was basically ghosts, and they're in the underworld. Uh, and this was before they expanded it. This was just in the mid-90s, late mid to late 90s. Uh, I got all kinds of splat books for it. I've got, like, uh, I've got uh, the player's guides. I've got... Um, I've got specific books for clans that I enjoyed uh, that I enjoyed playing. Although those of you who who have watched my stuff realize that wait a minute, enjoyed playing, but you didn't play more than a couple times. Uh, the story behind these is that um, I bought them at the time because some of our group wanted to play Vampire the Masquerade. I was not really into it, but when I go in, I since I'm the guy that everybody's looking at me to run shit, I'm the guy that runs like the D and D and the sci fi stuff. Uh, everybody was looking for, to me to run shit, and I did not want. I, I was like, man, I don't like I don't like White Wolf uh, games. I mean, I appreciate them, I understand what they're aiming for, and I understand that a lot of people enjoy them, but I just don't personally get into it. Um, and you want me to run it, and I, I'll run a few games, but the tipping point was that there were um, on on a couple occasions, uh, people who were uh, into uh, the Vampire the Masquerade understand that it had a higher percentage of female players at the time, and uh, than most of the other games did. And simply from a demographic standpoint, when you're when you're somebody in high school, and an attractive woman asks you, "Hey, can you run this this game for me?" Then, uh, yeah, you're gonna. You, uh, at least I was going to run it, yeah. So I picked up the books. I picked up enough to run it. And then I picked up a few more just because uh, of a need to complete the series, although I never actually bought all of them. <sighs> I ran a couple games. They weren't great. Uh, they were apparently impressive enough to impress the people that played them, but they were not my best work, and you could tell I was not really interested in it. And then some of the, uh, some of the people that were playing decided to go ahead and run the game and asked me to play since I never got to play. And I was like, 
why can't you run D and D and let me play? I always get, I always am the one that's DMing the D and D. Almost never get to play. I only get to like I, I can count on the number on my one hand the number of times I actually played D and D rather than DM'd it. Uh, but no, no, they were they were cool. Um, they were saying, oh, you know, well, we're gonna run, we're gonna run White Wolf. So you make yourself a character. Uh, and of course, me being me, my favorite of the White Wolf games was Wraith. But there's no real easy way for a Wraith to interact with. Uh, a group of people in the world of the living, so to speak. That is, unless you own this. <laughs> and the Risen is basically a way for wraiths to uh, to re-inhabit their dead bodies. And the crow, uh, you're basically the crow. You, you're, you've got an anchor in the real world. All wraiths have an anchor. And in this one, one of your anchors is your own body. And so you hop into it and you pick yourself up and you can do things in that body. Um, so me being me, we had a group of vampires. And um, I was like, fuck, I don't want to play Vampire the Masquerade. Well, you can play any White Wolf product. Except, just keep in mind, you don't want to play a you don't want to play a werewolf because they'll be battling with the vampires. I said, oh, I don't want to play a werewolf anyway. Uh, it's not my style. And I said, Well, you don't. I mean, if you're going to be mortal, then maybe it, they may there there's the masquerade in force. They're they're they they may be in trouble. I said, No, no. Here's what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to make a character, and I'm going to go over here. I'm going to talk to the DM. I'm going to make a character, and I'll come back. I said, Okay, okay. And so I walk up with my character, my new character. I said, First, first, first thing somebody does, is say, I say, I use the uh, aspects to uh, see if they're living. No, nah, he's not living. No heartbeat, no nothing. I said, well, okay then. Uh, I guess you're a vampire. And I'm like, let's go with that. <laughs> well, what clan are you? Well, I think that's a rude question, man. I'm not really into many clans. I guess you can call if you, you know, I'm not really, don't really hold a, a strong connection with any clan. Oh, you're just a caitiff. And I'm like, whatever, man. Whatever. And, and so we're we're playing the game, right? And we get into a fight with another group of vampires. And um, one of them tries to drain me. One of them tries to uh, diabolize me. And discovers in that horrific moment that, 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 that my character is not a vampire. And he's spitting out like embalming fluid and shit. And the rest of the group is like taken aback in horror. And I'm like, oh man, cat's out of the bag now. Now, the Risen can become real maniacs when they're, uh, when they want to be. Because they're basically in a puppet rather than, you know, in a living body or a body that even feels pain. So I promptly start just tear, just beating this vampire and I don't even know if I don't even know if Risen can cause aggravated damage. So all I did was basically take the vampire that had bitten me and exposed me for, you know, not being a vampire, and just beat them and beat them and beat them until the non-aggravated damage started piling up. And I basically beat this vampire into a jelly mush right in front of the rest of the, my party that was just staring on, all horrified. And I'm stand up and I'm like, you know what? Sorry, guys. I'm not... <laughs> and the look on their faces when they discovered that my character was a, was actually a ghost. I was like, what are you going to do? For, what are you going to do to me? Kill me again? I'm a damn ghost. What do you want? Uh, the game didn't continue much further than that, but it did... We got, we got, the, we got the, the storytelling session done and we got that story arc done. But yeah, that's my my uh, my favorite White Wolf style memory. I've played it a few times, but not many times. That was the one time I really genuinely had fun. Oh, that and the Nosferatu, uh, I played once. Uh, uh, everybody basically was pissing on him because he was Nosferatu and treating him like shit uh, all the way from the prince on down. So um, I got a tanker truck full of gasoline 
<laughs> and <laughs> and <laughs> drove it uh, into the Princess Haven and uh, de- <laughs> de- detonated it. <laughs> I was like, here, I have a tanker truck full of flaming gasoline. Boom. Uh, yeah, but that, at that point, I was just mostly pissed off because it was like my character was singled out. <laughs> and I was I was just mostly pissed off uh, at the way that particular game was going. I'll tell you what, though. It ended with a bang, didn't it? <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, you can tell I'm not a big fan of, of White Wolf. Uh, I, see, I see it has its merits, and I understand a lot of people really enjoy it, but I, I'm just not one of those people. Um, yeah, I'm not even going to go into all my specific, uh, splat books on that. Uh, one thing I am going to go, one last thing I am going to touch on. Now, keeping in mind, I have a ton of other books that are unclassified, either because I just couldn't figure out where to classify them or because of the state that they're in. There's a couple in there that are like third party books for third edition that I purchased that I didn't put up here because they're not like a main, a main group of books. Uh, but there is one more thing I want to touch on, and that is... Oh, crap. Descent, Journeys in the Dark, 2nd Edition, which is not a role-playing game. It's a board game based on role-playing games. It's a modular dungeon-calling board game, and I am actually doing a RPG Crawler Reviews on this box and another one. I've got it scripted out. I've got the audio recorded. I just need to get footage of the box and some sample gameplay. Uh, and you can expect to see that, um, holy hell, by the time this goes up, it's probably already been up. Um, I'll put a link in the description below to the video. Uh, this is one of those games where I got it and then my group book broke up. I got this in like 2013 or so. It came out in, it came out in 2013, yeah, it came out in 2012. Uh, there was an edition before it that was like 2000, mid-2000s. Um, it was revised to second edition 2012. I picked this up in 2013. My group broke up. My local group broke up, one of my local groups broke up after it, so I never actually got a chance to play it with other people. Which is disappointing because I threw like 70 bucks at this in an expansion. It's a really fun game. You'll see more of it in that video, which I will link or whatever. Uh, but I just thought I'd mention it. It's, uh, I got a love of board game RPGs, but I don't have anybody to, like local, all my stuff now is done online. So I don't really have that uh, capability to just sit down and play one of these multiplayer board games all night. Uh, anyway, that having been said, I think that about concludes my uh, my bookshelf tour, so to speak, of those things that you can see and those things which are RPG related. Um, I've got another bookshelf full of like video. I've got bookshelves full of video games, uh, not to the point of some collectors, but to a point. I've got shelves full of like sci-fi and fantasy. I've got spells, sh- shelves full of inspiration. I've got a ton of books uh, that are not really relevant to this channel. Um, I may cover some things that are like inspirational in future RPG Crawler uh, videos, uh, but for now, I'm going to leave it here. This has been the RPG Crawler with RPG Storytime. If you like what you've seen, remember to like, comment, and subscribe for more RPG content. Until next time, take care and goodbye.